Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Greg Peterson here, and welcome to the 290th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where three days a week we work together educating and inspiring you to become part of your food revolution. Nature doesn't waste energy, and by using these natural cycles to work in our favor, we can harvest both plants and fish. Let us teach you how. Just text GROWFISH to 33444 or visit IWANTTOGROWFISH.COM and you will receive our free webinar on how to grow your own fish-powered garden. Today on our podcast, we have someone who is helping his local area restaurants with branding and promotion. We're talking with Chris Gruler about going local with restaurants and produce. Chris has been in the branding internet game for close to 12 years, using his strengths in branding, storytelling, website development, and online strategy for growth. He has worked with Fortune 500 companies, professional athletes, and small businesses who are looking to expand or protect their brand online. Chris started ProtégéBranding.com in 2007 with the intent to assist companies and brands with their online presence. One such project dedicated to restaurants and local dining is ScottsdaleRestaurants.com, where they create video reviews of local area restaurants to showcase the positive aspect of each one. A key piece that they highlight is how each restaurant uses locally grown produce. Chris is all about telling stories and assists his customers in telling the right one for their brand. Welcome to the show today, Chris. Thank you for having me. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at today? Yeah, absolutely. So I actually was a baseball player. I got drafted out of high school. Wow, um, really? Uh, yeah, by the Cincinnati Reds. Yes, sir. I got drafted in the first round out of high school. And my career kind of took a interesting path, not the path that I wanted. I ended up having three so- uh, shoulder surgeries Ooh, over the course ouch. of seven years. Yeah. So ended up, my career ended short, but during that time, I started getting into domaining and I I noticed a lot of my friends didn't brand themselves personally. Everything was team related, right? We we went Uh out, we wore a team uniform, Right. where this is when Michael Jordan and the Jumpman really came out and he was kind of that self-brander. He uh, was the pioneer uh, on a lot of that from an athlete standpoint. Mm Mm-hmm. So I really started diving into it on a micro level and seeing, you know, what some of these athletes can do, you know, for their own personal brands. And it kind of took over from there, to be honest. So a, a lot of the times when I had surgery, I had a lot of, a lot of spare time. Uh-huh. I started learning how to uh, develop on WordPress, which at that time was a rudimentary blog. And then from there, I started learning the branding process, you know, how to monetize online the social media aspect of everything and kind of tying in that whole branding philosophy to really assist with uh, these professional athletes. And then from there, it kind of took off. After my career was over, I I jumped right into Protégé. I knew I was passionate about it and it kind of gravitated towards helping out a lot of businesses, being a a marketing extension for them. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately us starting a few of our own brands, kind of putting our money where our mouth is type. Right. So it's kind of uh, led led us to here today. Wow. So I don't even know where to go with all of this. There's so much there. So Chris, you used a word called domaining. And, you know, I own a lot of domains, but I'm not really quite clear what you mean by that. Yeah, absolutely. So there's this, uh, especially, you know, about 10 years ago, 12, 12, 15 years ago, there's this huge subculture of once the internet had, had its boom in the, in the, in the late nineties, mm-hmm. where there was a lot of guys that were in the domain industry that bought a lot of these singular domain names. Oh, so like yes. farm.com, lettuce.com, you know, and, and you can shower I mean, we can, you know, we can go any different realm there. So I actually started diving into it because I had a good buddy that was, one of the first employees at GoDaddy. Oh, when really? They, when they first started. Uh-huh. Uh, yes, sir. So he kind of got me into this whole domain thing. And I'm like, wow, what is this? And started diving into it and, and purchasing a, a lot of domain names. But then I noticed that a lot of my friends' domains were already taken. And uh-huh. I go, huh. So I would ask them, like, even, you know, 
Ken Griffey Jr., Tom Glavin, Roberto Alomar, a lot of these guys that I've spoken with and that I've, I've done stuff with, I was always curious of why their domain's taken. And, and their response was, I, I, don't own the own, I, don't, I don't own my own domain name. And I go, well, what do you mean? So then I would start doing research, and it, and it turns out other people own the domain name. Right. So then, you know, there's this whole subculture of of the domaining game and the domaining transactions and everything, where, where you know you see a lot of people now that are, if they're trying to start a new business or trying to brand themselves appropriately, they either have to find a different URL or a different extension. Yeah. Like a .dot biz, a you know a .dot co, a .dot ninja. You know, it there's a lot. Out of uh, they're called GTLDs that are coming into perspective now, but yeah, it, it's 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 very unique. Been in it for a long time, and and that's how we kind of acquired mm. and, and had the domain ScottsdaleRestaurants.com. So a hyper local, definitive yeah, exactly search term. Yep. Yeah, perfect. So tell me about ScottsdaleRestaurants.com. It's what do you do and how do you do it? So the, the beauty of it is is there's three of us, myself, Troy, and Miguel. Miguel's a cinematographer. He's been with us at Protégé for about two years now. Troy's a content writer and mm-hmm. a project manager. I'll bet. Hold and on. He, hold on. I'll bet Troy's an eater as well, right? So he goes he, to these restaurants and he eats and then he writes about it. Absolutely. Well, I the, want the, that job. Well, the beauty of it is, <laughs> Greg, we do this, like all three of us go into the restaurant uh-huh. and we film ourselves the entire experience, oh, uh, sit down wow. to finish. And we condense this video to a three to five minute showcase of the restaurant. And and here's the here's the thing, like we wanted to do this for the, you know, we're all from the Scottsdale area. We love this area. We love we love local. We love buying local, mm-hmm. and we love to eat. <laughs> so, there you go. And and drink. There's nothing wrong with drinking too. Yeah. So we're, we you know we started this brand with okay, let's see what the issues that we're seeing here in local small food restaurant businesses, and what problem can we solve? Mm-hmm. And the first one that we saw was a lot of different review sites and the authenticity of them. Oh um, yes. A lot of. A lot of pay-to-play models out there, a lot of paid reviews. If someone has a bad day or a bad experience, it could seriously negative impact that local business Mm -hmm. financially. So we set out to do something different, showcase our storytelling, our our branding, and stuff that we've done for other clients for almost 10 years, and and us tell the story of the local business. So we go in, we do those video reviews. We really focus on the positivity element there uh-huh. and showcase a lot of the, you know, the local produce, the local spirits, you know, all the stories behind a lot of these restaurant owners, which is great, you know, and, and it's kind of morphed over the last two years into something that we never expected, you know, which is a uh, humbling and fun all wrapped up into one. Nice. So what has it turned into that you didn't expect? It's turned into a full-fledged business, you know, you know, and, and we met on a couple TV segments. So, you know, we're, you know, we're being asked to show up on TV pretty regularly to kind of showcase different food in the Phoenix metropolitan area. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's really taken off. So it's, it's been a full-fledged business. That's for sure. Fantastic. So th- a couple of things come to mind. First of all, you don't know this about me, but I started my first business in 1975. Very cool. So I've been self-employed for 42 years. So somebody started talking to me about something like this. And I've, I've along the way, I've had 30, I don't know, 31, 32, 33 businesses. Some of them lasted a sneeze is what I tell people. And others, mm-hmm. I had two that have lasted over 20 years each. So I've had, you know, some successes and not some successes. And when So when I look at this model of yours, it seems like you have this nice refined model. And this might be something that somebody in Berkeley might want to put in place or in Houston, or in Timbuktu, Idaho? Is this, is this a model that you're developing for other people to be able to go out and use? No, that's a, that's a great question. And, and by the way, mad respect for you for, uh, you know, over the last 30 plus years, that's uh, super commendable. Thank so, you. Uh, you're, it sounds rock star. I love that. Well, love I, hearing I, stories I, like that. I tell people I'm unemployable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love it. Love it. So yeah, you know, me being a, a domain guy and, and us having some, some really good people that, that consult for us mm-hmm. um, on the business and, and whatnot, you know, our focus is, is do, do we scale, you know, laterally or, you know, do we go vertically and vertically meaning do we take, you know, different niches such as right. like we, we own domain names like scottsdalegolfcourses.com. Oh. Uh, you know, 
Yes. So we, we have, you know, Scottsdale hotels.com. So we have a lot of these different ones where we have these different niches that we can really take the same exact model and positively affect mm. um, the same local market. Mm -hmm. But with that being said, yes, we, we do have the, the ability to kind of scale uh, horizontally and we have been reached out by other cities and to kind of see, you know, what that process would look like. My biggest thing looking at it from a business standpoint now is for us to stay true to our roots when mm. we started, you know, two, two and a half years ago. Right. So we never charge for a video review and we never will charge for a video review. We just asked for gift cards from the restaurant and then that, that, that they comp our meals. And then that way, those gift cards that we get, we pass them out to our VIP list. Ah, so, very good. So literally drives traffic back, you know, butts in the seats. Like mm -hmm. we want them to, to try the restaurant and go back. But the biggest thing is just staying true to the roots and then us being able to see if there's interest in other cities and, you know, see how we can kind of replicate that model and make sure that we, uh, you know, we, we keep making that positive change, that positive effect in, in, in the branding and the storytelling that we're doing. So, right. right. So m my question is, how are you monetizing it? Fantastic question. So we have three different points of, of uh, monetization. Mm -hmm. So the, the great thing is I told the guys when we first started this, I was like, throw the, the, the way to make money and the monetization and the, the money models and everything, throw that out the window. Uh -huh. We're not going to make money. We're not going to make money the first two years. It's not going to happen. So I had them re reprogram their thinking and really focus on providing value for the local restaurants. Mm, so, nice. so with that, so with that came a phone call from a couple companies like Red Bull and Anheuser-Busch and a lot of these really big name companies that wanted to be like, hey, we want to throw parties in local restaurants that we have taps on or that we have spirits in. Mm, nice. Yes. Yeah, so that's initially kind of where it gravitated towards. But since we have launched, uh, we have a pre-roll product where if a local business or something like, for instance, we've had about three or four so far, we actually do embedded pre-roll videos, but they're creatives with us in them <laughs> and we like for instance we had vip mortgage as our last pre-roll sponsor mm, so mm -hmm. we we made up this creative of miguel troy and myself going into their office as the mics to team hype team of vip mortgage oh fun and, and we're literally like just praising everyone we come in with a t-rex outfit and so the the end user, the you know, our fans and every all the followers can still watch these, you know, these video reviews that come up, but they see 15 or 30 seconds of us in branded paid content. Mm -hmm. They still see the validity in there and they're willing to watch right. that. So we're able to gain that attention from them where if I just throw a 15 second pre-roll ad out there, they're gone. We're yeah. losing. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the models. And then our second model, which has been fantastic for both the restaurants and ourselves too. We have a directory and a happy hour live tab. And we have a nominal yearly fee for the restaurant to be listed on both of those. Ah. And then exactly. And then we drive traffic around that hyperlink back to their restaurant, shows the location on Google Maps. So if an end user really needs to figure out where they want to eat for the evening or have happy hour, they come to our site and we have just a, a plethora, a mix of of different restaurants uh, in the valley, so mm -hmm. it kind of, uh, you know, it, it it definitely helps them with you know linking back with SEO, and then on top of that, being able to be found on our website to right. really uh, hit them up on a nominal fee. You know, having been an entrepreneur for many decades, one of the things that I've always appreciated is we want to give. You know, I'm I'm an entrepreneur, and that's really what I want to do. I really want to go out into the you know out of out into the city, out in the universe, and and just give value. And one of the things I love about what you've done is you created huge, huge value, and you just gave it to these restaurants. And what's happened for you is the universe said, "Okay, great. Now here's what you get in return." So I I'm sure you've found that right. Yeah. Yeah. I think with us taking that attitude and us genuinely wanting to assist and help mm -hmm. these, uh, these local restaurants, like a lot of them, you know, go through this whole process. I hear it day in and day out, especially Troy, cause Troy handles a lot of day-to-day -day operations mm -hmm. and he sees these local restaurants that either a get taken advantage of by a marketing firm or, you know, a PR firm or something like that, where they, you know, over promise under deliver. Yep. And, you know, we, we hear different stories about them getting burned on something or, 
or or that they just don't know. They don't understand how to market their restaurant in a hyper local um, atmosphere right. and and how to tell that story properly. So, you know, us being able to show our content, show what we can do, provide a tremendous amount of value, actually, you know, brings that level of trust. Right. So if they want to come back and, and need assistance, uh, you know, from video shoots to telling different stories to ad creation to media buying to, you know, any of that, then we kind of guide them into protege and and then protege kind of handles all of that. So it. It, it's fantastic to see that it, it really mm -hmm. is. It's it's such a cool full circle model, like you mentioned, you know, yeah. you you go out there, you actually give an S uh, about a brand and enter or a restaurant. And then in turn, you know, you build that trust, which which is what it's all about in business. I, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in that oh, yeah. firm believer in shaking hands, looking people in the eyes. Uh, my father uh, has, is, a, is a very stern, you know, business entrepreneur and businessman. Uh -huh. And, you know, he's kind of instilled that in me. So I, I feel like it's we have the right group. We have the right team now. And, you know, we're going to be constantly providing value for a lot of these local businesses. Yeah, beautiful. So let's talk about branding specifically a little bit here because, you know, our listeners are, you know, a lot of home gardeners. We've got small farms, we've got restaurants. So for those of us out there, and I'm including myself in that, that don't really have a great grasp of what it takes to do branding, can you kind of point me in the direction of three things to look at in this whole branding thing that would help me at the Urban Farm get my word out and maybe even monetize the space? Great question. So, so for me, hands down, the number one, I don't know if I have three, I, I kind of have one right off the top uh -huh. and then it's, you know, and then we have different little subsections that I go when I usually talk with different clients. Perfect. But the number one overview is what's the story you're telling? What's mm. your story? And you can actually reverse engineer that. So once I get the understanding of what that, uh, let's say a local farmer, you know, what is your story? Uh -huh. For instance, I, I grew up in Brentwood, California, which is uh, the, the Northern California, which is very well known for uh, their corn. Mm, right. And a local, very successful uh, family friend of mine, the, the Stonebarger family, has been, you know, growing corn for many, many years. And they supply local Safeways and do very wow. well for themselves. Yeah. So they actually, which is, it was so cool to see. I, you know, I still get chills uh, seeing it. But Safeway came in and did a co-op with them and basically told the story of of the Stonebargers mm. and it being a family farm. Right. And how much passion they put into the entire process and being able to feed families that want to walk into a local Safeway. So I, I take an approach of what's the story you're telling? What story do you have to tell? Uh -huh. And then I wrap it all around. And the biggest thing is humanizing that experience. Mm. You have to bring everything back to humanizing that story. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to reach that end user. You're not going to be able to touch that that person that's a, a, that's a potential customer. You, you kind of have to hit the feels a little bit to, to engage with them. Mm -hmm. The number one, I've said this for years, the number one traded commodity when we're talking a, a branding strategy or media buying execution or anything like that is hands down attention. So we have to be very specific with how we get other people's attention. In, the, in this in this space because right. people are not very attentive now they <laughs> you know you get two or three seconds max on certain things someone else's you know grabs their attention we live in that world in that space now right so first things first i think that's the biggest thing is is taking a big overview of kind of like an audit of mm -hmm. what's the story that you're trying to tell and consume and then from there you can kind of reverse engineer that and work your way back up the second element in us, you know, being on the digital end is really focusing on your social strategy. So a, a, a lot of people do social media incorrectly and overthink it, overanalyze it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's that's something where it, it's it, it's it doesn't it's not rocket science. It's it's something that, you know, you can you can be self-taught and you can learn how to properly do it. You know, uploading posts, you know, natively as opposed to cross promoting on, you, you know, doing a push from mm -hmm. Instagram to Facebook, stuff like that. Right. Simple, simple, easy tweaks like that. So, you know, doing a complete audit of what story you're trying to tell and your whole social media structure. 
And then the other one is you're paid, you're new, you're your new potential consumer and, and customer. What mm. demographic are you targeting? What locational base are you targeting? Are you a local farm? Are you a local restaurant? Who would be interested in your products and your ability to reach them effectively, telling a story that that demographic would love to be told. Mm, right. So I think those that's a great place to start, and mm -hmm. that's usually what my discovery meetings are with clients is within 45 minutes or an hour, I understand their business. I want to I hear more. They know best, but I want to help them kind of reverse engineer their thought process and hear their story that they want to tell, and then being able to tell that story is where it's at. Beautiful, beautiful. So I, I mostly ask that question because I'm curious for myself. You know, I do right. all of this great work out in the world and probably could use some shining up. So we'll chat about that later. What I really want to do next is talk about, you know, one or two stories coming out of restaurants and connecting it with food. You got any epic stories of, of uh, ScottsdaleRestaurants.com? Oh, I have quite a bit. I, I would say the coolest thing is twofold, I think. So one is from, um, you know, we've had multiple restaurants that have just... Whether it's uh, we, we walk in or if I'm taking my wife out to eat or Troy's taking his wife out to eat and the restaurant owner comes up and gives us a hug. Mm -hmm. Like I get very emotional when I when I when that happens because of the fact that in, in a digital world, we always talk about ROIs and what's your conversion rate, what's your CPA, your CPM, all of all of kind of the nonsense that I really don't. I don't like to talk about. I mm -hmm. like to talk about that story yeah. and delivering a good message. And when I go into a restaurant and I, you know, I get shown love uh, and just true downright appreciation for what you're providing, mm -hmm. there, there's nothing better than that. And, and it makes you want to do more for that restaurant, <laughs> yeah. it, it, you know, and we've built some fantastic relationships with these restaurants over the last two years. Yeah. So to me, that's where it's at. You know, The second one is actually on the other side with an end user or a fan of ours. We'll go out and I'll, for instance, I was in a local spot called the Gladly about two weeks ago mm -hmm. having dinner with my wife and two couples came up and said, Chris, I'm, I'm so sorry for interrupting. We absolutely love what you are doing. This is fantastic. You know, me and my husband don't argue anymore about where to go to eat. <laughs> you nice. solve those problems for us. So, you know, we, you know, we thank you and, and keep up the great work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just, like I said, it's, it's that positive affirmation. And, you know, you, you, you sit back and you, you ponder and you look back over the last two and a half years of going, wow, like this was nothing before. And right. now we've provided something that solves a lot of headache, heartache, and issues that we're seeing in a hyper-local market mm -hmm. on both sides. And, and that's cool to see. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So how in this whole process that you're working with, how have you seen local farms and restaurants connecting? Great question. So, you know, and I, I'm very transparent with mm -hmm. this and saying that we're not foodies. We're, we're learning a tremendous amount from different restaurants, from different chefs, from, uh, you know, people in the spirit industry or whatnot. The biggest thing that we're seeing is, is over the last, you know, three, three to four years, we're seeing a lot of, you know, local produce, you know, you're seeing a lot of this stuff on menus, you know, now. And I think now it's kind of a standard with a lot of these restaurants of, yep. of utilizing local farms, local produce. It's kind of like a badge of honor. It's very inspiring and we love to see it. And when we're telling our review story about that, if they have that element and, and bring that to the forefront, then we showcase that mm, right away. Right. Right away. Because I think it creates not only a very unique approach to uh, like seasonal menus, yes. being able to, to change the course based on what, you know, what farmers are growing, what time of the year, especially in an Arizona climate. Oh, yeah. So they get real unique and I feel like it just adds to that eating experience or that restaurant. And there's a little bit more added validity to what they're mm -hmm. doing, I think. Oh, yeah. You know, taking pride in what they're doing. You know, we see a lot of these documentaries on, on Netflix and whatnot about a lot of these Michelin star rated chefs that do just this in their local environment. Mm -hmm. And it's inspiring. Yeah. So. I would say that that's the biggest thing that we see from our end is when we go in, we hear the connections, you know, from the chef and hear how passionate they are yeah. and some of the different farms that they, you know, that they're utilizing or local spirits that they're utilizing. Mm -hmm. 
that's that's our jam. We love hearing that. <laughs> love it. Love it, love it, love it. And that's the branding piece as well. You just yes. you basically you just explained a branding piece for a restaurant, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, it's it's crazy to look back like I've been doing this for twelve years, but uh-huh. I feel like everything always revolves and gets back to the story, yeah. telling the proper story and, yeah. and and making sure that branding is aligned with with your story. So yeah. it's I I know I'm probably on re, on repeat on that, but uh, it's so- uh it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. You know, and the, the, the purpose for this podcast is to put this stuff on repeat so that people hear it over and over and over and over again. So, uh, you know, because that's how we learn, right? Right. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So, hey, I'm going to shift on you. I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure and what you might have learned from it. Great question. So it's not something that I talk about quite a bit, to be honest. This was about eight or nine years ago. And I had one one particular idea mm-hmm. that kind of came to fruition, and we started to to execute on it, and and it it was going very well, and you know we dumped a lot of time, effort, sweat, equity into it, probably money and, too. Yes, yeah, and money, and we it was it was technology based, and we got to a point where a big big which we didn't think at the time, uh, a, a social media company was a, ended up being a competitor and brought a product to market mm. when we were about three weeks to four weeks <laughs> out of launching. Yeah. Yeah. And it was derived around a lot of professional athletes and, and utilizing their brand and technology to kind of synchronize everything together, mm-hmm. be able to shoot live video, being able to, you know, post from their website to their application and everything seamlessly. Yeah. And the, 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 the biggest thing for me is execution. My, my father, and, and I share this quote all the time, this message that he's, he sent to me is, he's like, son, when you're in business, it's always about, or people are always about their feet and their lips. And he says, a lot of people are about their lips. Not a lot of people are about their feet. Mm-hmm. I want you to be a man about your feet and execute. Mm. So he's using the term of feet and lips, just a lot of people talk. Yeah. Not a lot of people use their feet and move and execute. Yeah. Yeah. And in that project, I failed that team by a lot of lip service, as I call it. Mm. I moved my lips a lot. And I, and you know, I, I look back and I feel, I feel terrible that I didn't see a new competitor come into the market and just mm-hmm. absolutely, you know, demolishing what we do, uh, what we've done. And I think the learning experience there is just to set smaller goals and stay consistent mm-hmm. and execute. Mm-hmm. We were so stuck on the big picture of what we're going to do. Are we going to get bought out? Are we going to, you know, we're going to get 150 athletes by the end of the year where I shouldn't have even been thinking that direction or doing that. It should have been like, Hey, we're going to sign another athlete this week. I'm going to get one athlete this week yeah, and we're going to execute on this functionality and we're going to lock it down. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's 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 really allowed me to sit back and say, okay, you can have a big picture, you can have a pro forma, you can have a three to five year, ten year plan. That's great, but the proof is in the weekly executions, the weekly meetings, the 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 small singles. Mm-hmm. If I can do a base, baseball reference, you know, you're going to hit doubles every now and then, yep. and then once in a great while you'll hit a home run, and right. that's because you're hitting singles and doubles. <laughs> So that was the biggest learning experience for me. And I've failed time and time again. I still fail, you know, with smaller things with uh, clients in our different brands that Mm -hmm. I I thought, you know, should have worked out a different way. But the best thing for me is just being humble about it, understanding if I make a, a mistake to own up to it in whatever capacity that is. Yeah. And then learn from it and then execute and dominate the next time. The next time. Exactly. Exactly. As my buddy Bill Hammond says, how far did you move the football forward this week? There you go. Using a, yep. using a sports reference. So what do you consider your biggest success? Who? That's a tough one. I'm going to mix it up here because I, I think my biggest success was both when I was playing professionally mm-hmm. and business wise. I was pitching. I remember this one time I recall where I was pitching in front of about 15, 20,000 people. And I, I look over to the right when I'm on the mound, uh, in the stands and I see my mom and dad there and you know, like the look on their face 
was just of just like complete fr- from my standpoint is just like, wow, like yeah. this is it, you mm-hmm. know, like, you know, you, th- this, this is what you want from your parents. And you see the love and the excitement that they're, that they have for their son is, is something that, uh, that I, I treasure. And, and I, and I, I see success in that. Mm-hmm. The second one is, is because after my career, I had a little spurt where I was in, you know, it, it was, it was tough. It was tough to bounce back for about right. a year and a half, two years. I'd, I felt sorry for myself, but then being able to sit back and, and now, you know, every now and then my dad and, uh, you know, like I said, he's a tough businessman, but my dad will just shoot me an email and he just says, son, I'm very proud of you. You know, he'll see like a, a TV spot or something like that. And every now and yeah. then he'll just, he'll just say, son, I'm very proud of you. What you're doing is fantastic. Keep up yeah. the great work. And then my mom will say the exact same thing. Nice. So. I don't pin success on uh, what I have in the bank. You know, what if if protege grows seventy five percent this month or you know this year? Mm-hmm. I don't view that. I view success on on what I get back, what I retain back from yeah. clients, from from my parents. You know, I'm I'm on that love language of affirmation. So I uh, I kind of sit back and I I love to retain that in because that's yeah. a lot of powerful information for yeah. me. I can see that actually. I can see that. So what drives you? Oh, that's that's a tough question. Honestly, it changes me, uh, uh-huh. or it, it changes periodically. You know, I I'm all about. I want to live a legacy or leave a legacy. Mm-hmm. Both. I, I have. Both. Yeah. Live, live, and leave. Yeah, that's yeah. great. All right, perfect. I learned another one today. <laughs> but you, you know, my biggest thing is leaving a legacy, and and I have some great family friends and some business confidants that I that I speak to regularly, and and they're they're you know a lot older than me, but you know seeing what they have and the the wealth of knowledge that they have, and you know they have grandkids and and their sons and daughters are taking over businesses over their businesses, mm-hmm. and being able to see that legacy there keeps me in the driver's seat of saying I want this for my children. I want this for my children's children. I want to take care of my, my my mom and dad and sister, my wife that, that have done nothing but supported my entrepreneurial spirit, my coming home on a Tuesday night, wanting to rip my hair out, (laughs) coming home there, coming home the next day and at the ultimate highs because something happened, you know, that, that's, that's what drives me Yeah, is the legacy. Yeah. Nice. Nice. I, I can completely get that. So if you could recommend one resource for our listeners, what would it be and why? I'm going to do two podcasts. All right. I'm going to do the Tim Ferriss podcast Mm -hmm. and the Joe Rogan podcast. Mm. So the the Tim Ferriss podcast is interesting because during my off time, I'm I'm an avid boxer. I've been boxing for a long time. And uh, kind of, you know, on the healthy kind of direction, I, I, I love to eat a lot of organic foods. You know, I, uh, I hunt, I like to eat, you know, non-processed mm-hmm. meat. I really focus on that with, uh, you know, local, local farms that we have out here, farmer's market, all that stuff. So to me, I think Tim Ferriss brings on some really good people on his podcast as well. And same with Joe Rogan too, kind of just gives me a uh, a different perspective on things at times. And it's, if, if I'm driving and I have a few minutes, then I'll, I'll kind of pop those in. Yeah. Tim Ferriss, I'm quite familiar with, but not so much Joe Rogan. Can you give me 15 seconds on each one about what their podcast is about? Yeah. So Tim Ferriss kind of brings in just a wide variety of people. Like one of my favorite ones is Dr. Rhonda Patrick, who talks about, you know, ketones and a ketogenic diet and Mm. being able to do a lot of supplementation with local foods, local produce. She's just dialed in and Mm. on points. Mm -hmm. Very impressive to to, to learn, to learn a, a lot of different, uh, things from her. So right. Tim, Fer- Tim Ferriss brings on a, a, just a wide variety of people, you know, from weightlifting, he's brought on Wim Hof who does ice baths in, wow. in Amsterdam and, yeah. you know, talk about cold therapy and stuff like mm-hmm. that. So it's just off the wall kind of stuff that really, but health and fitness. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And Joe um, Rogan. Joe Rogan's kind of along the same lines. He gets sometimes in the political realm with like new kind of new 
kind of the latest stories that come up or whatnot. But mm-hmm. uh, I, I don't necessarily listen to a lot of those. I'm not a huge political guy, but he does have a lot of different, you know, doctors, a lot of different dietitians, and 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 other people in the, in that kind of health health food right. industry as well. And and he's actually pretty big into like mixed martial arts and the fight game. So oh. me being me being a boxer, I I really like to kind of yeah. hear his perspective on things. I think he's he looks at things very objectively. And the podcasts are very long. I think that's the beauty of that is like in social media now, you know, it's just like comment here, comment back. And there's a lot of negativity in the world, whereas people could just sit down and have a conversation kind of like we are now. Uh-huh. You know, we can learn a lot about a different point of view, a different mm, person, exactly. something that something that you might not have heard or understand or, or thought about. So, you know, I, I like to keep an open mind on that and constantly learn. Yeah. So. You know, that's a big, big thing. We don't take sides here at the Urban Farm Podcast, and we just we present, you know, all kinds of stories, all the way from hunting to vegan and everything in between. So, right. um, I think that's really important for us to all keep our minds open. That, you know, not everybody's a vegan out there, and you know they have their reasons for it. Uh, right. You know, so on and so on. So, so yay. So, what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? I always go back to that feats and lips quote that my pops always told oh, me, yeah. but, uh, but the beauty of it is there's one that I always tell a client that maybe has a, a little bit tougher time on, on the execution side mm-hmm. is look at it as, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Yeah. You have, you have a, a daunting task ahead of you, but the only way to do it is to set small little subset goals and mm-hmm. being able to tackle that and execute as a whole. Yeah. So I, I like that one. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. It was it was fantastic. Absolutely. Hey, how can our listeners get a hold of you? Well, I mean, the the easiest way is just please please email me, Chris C H R I S at protegebranding dot com. P R O T E G E branding dot com. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. Mm-hmm. If you have any branding, if they have any branding, storytelling, videography questions, or anything yep. like that, you know, feel free to reach out. Beautiful. So, Beautiful. That's protégébranding.com. Also, scottsdalerestaurants.com. Absolutely. You can also find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash protégébranding. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Nature doesn't waste energy, and by using these natural cycles to work in our favor, we can harvest both plants and fish. Let us teach you how. Just text GROWFISH to 33444 or visit IWantToGrowFish.com and you'll receive our free webinar on how to grow your own fish-powered garden. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.